pull back there just in time to not blow you guys away. Welcome. Welcome to this wonderful weekend where we in this nation celebrate freedom. We celebrate freedom every Sunday, church. Every Sunday, our freedom in Christ laid down his life for us. Oh, it's wonderful to celebrate freedom. It's wonderful. Everything that it means for us, everything that it follows for us, it is wonderful to celebrate together. Where's your joy? Where's your joy? The joy of the Lord is my strength. You feeling weak? Where's your joy? The joy of the Lord never disappears. The joy of the Lord is never taken away. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Good morning, Josh. I'm a pastor here, and uh, I love you guys. Love you, church. Yeah, yesterday was a, a day for many to celebrate. In our household, we celebrate Ruth. Ruth was born on the 4th of July, and as, which who is, uh, for, for all of you out there, Ruth is our now six-year-old daughter. Yep, six. And uh, as my wife puts it, every woman who goes through later, labor should have fireworks afterwards to be able to watch out the window. My wife got that, which is amazing. So my day started at 6.30, sound asleep. Just, just close your eyes. You're sound asleep. Dad! Huh? And then my wife's day started with her husband next to her in bed going, ah! <laughs> so our hearts are racing right away in the morning. It's a good, it's a good time. It was wonderful uh, to celebrate for her birthday. This morning we are starting a new series all eyes on Jesus. We're going to be going through this through September. We're going to be looking at times of what the people of God were going through and where was Jesus in the midst of this. We need Jesus. We need all eyes on Jesus. So I'm going to ask you to open up your Bibles to Matthew this morning. Matthew chapter 14 is where we're going to start. And then starting next week, we're going to go all the way back to Genesis and then walk all the way through Revelation for the next three months. Immediately, starting verse 22, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. While he dismissed, he is Jesus, he dismissed the crowds, and after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, which is about three o'clock in the morning, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them, saying, take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out, immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Lord, we thank you for your word. Both the revelation that you gave us, the fullness, the sufficiency of Scripture, thank you for that word. And that you came as the word made flesh. Truly, Jesus, you are the Son of God. Our eyes are on you this morning, Lord. Prep our hearts and our minds to hear what you would have for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 
Now, I am going to zoom in this morning on a moment within this passage. We've preached this passage a lot. We focused on Peter a lot in the last even few years. So I'm going to zoom in really on, on one moment. But let's set this context here. Jesus is about his ministry, and you saw him dismissing the crowds and sending his disciples ahead of him in the boat, which is good to know. Disciples, when you face storms, when you face rough circumstances, that does not necessarily mean that you are out of the will of God. Sometimes he sends you right into the midst of the storm, ahead of him. This is all going on here around, and these, these waters, these winds are what they have to deal with. So we, we look here what Jesus did. Jesus sent them ahead. He took time to pray. And then he walked on the water through the storm and made himself known, and he called them out. Well, let's look at this uh, context. What did the disciples do? They obeyed Jesus, and they went ahead of him in the, in the boat. They ended up in the middle of the storm. Then they hunkered down in the boat, and they were afraid, assuming it was a ghost, even if it was the ghost of Jesus, which is an interesting little point. Is that a bit of foreshadowing? to later on when they have a tough time recognizing him as the resurrected Christ. And then they worshipped Jesus even after Peter sank, by the way. Rescued him, brought him back to the boat. The the storm was calmed and they worshipped him. What did Peter do? Peter made a supernatural request, received a supernatural response and responded accordingly and then was given a supernatural rescue. Just a little bit of context here to fill this out. A little bit of context. All of these pieces are taken in here in this one simple story. And so it is simple, and you've you've probably heard it many, 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 many times, but let's start here. This is miraculous. There's no explaining this away. This is miraculous. This this point you have to understand or nothing else will really impact you in a supernatural way. Do you have faith for the miraculous? Do you have faith that both Jesus walked on the water and Peter walked on the water? Start there. If you're trying to excuse this away, you will not get the lesson that is being taught here. The miraculous is true. It happens in the midst of the storm. It happens in the midst of natural reality. Miracles occur. Miracles occur. This is something we have to understand. So the moment that I want to zoom in on here is when they were afraid and Jesus spoke to them, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid, in the midst of this storm, and Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. That's where I want to focus. This is an incredible response from Peter. A request, actually. Lord, if it is you, what would you ask of the Savior of the world when you're in the boat in the midst of the storm. What would you ask of him? To calm the storm? Lord, if you don't want us to be afraid, give us strength so that we're not afraid. This is incredible. Peter gets knocked all the time, and I am a defender of Peter without a doubt. Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Every part of that is pretty incredible. You can dissect it. You can take it apart. Lord, quite a recognition there. He's not saying rabbi. He says, Lord, if it is you, command me. Lord, if it is you, command me. 
This is something that we've heard before, haven't we? Here I am, Lord, send me. We've heard that echoed throughout Scripture, haven't we? This is a servant's request. Peter is getting it at a level that none of the other disciples are really getting it. Even in this response, while there may be, might not be the full understanding of who Jesus is and everything that he is doing, there is something that Jesus is instilling in his disciples. You are servants. Even in the midst of the storm, respond as servants. Don't ask me to get rid of the storm. Ask me to command you. We are servants. We are the servant of the Lord. There's a burden that has been placed upon us to minister in the midst of the storm. Our eternity is secure. Minister in the midst of the storm. Lord, if it is you, all eyes on Jesus, church. If all of our eyes are on Jesus in the midst of the wind and the waves, Lord, if it is you, command me. Command me. Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Yes, his disciples are facing a difficult situation. Doesn't mean he didn't send them. They are sent into the midst of it. Jesus trains disciples to not only believe, not just talk about his way, but practice it through a supernatural walk. That supernatural walk, that's what demonstrates his authority. Do we demonstrate his authority? Even the word that is used here in Scripture on that come to you on the water. In the ESV it says on. You might have upon the water. There's this word there. In the Greek it's epi. It can mean to. It most often means upon. It can mean against. It can mean above. It is this word whose usage is specifically determined by the context. It expresses motion. Lord, if it is you, command me to move. The boat is safe. The boat is comfortable. In the natural, the boat is the only means to walk through this storm, to get through this storm. And, and Peter, seeing this, what could be a ghost, says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Because Jesus, wherever Jesus is, is more important to Peter than to be in the comfort zone. This is what I know. This is how I live. This is how we get through this. No. Who is that? Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He is called out, but he is asking to be called out. We are so reactionary sometimes because we get comfortable. It takes a storm for us to say, should I be here or should I be walking on the water right now? Upon the water, it expresses motion. And it's only use, when, when they interpret this word, they have to look at the context. All of you interns right there, right, right out here, what is the number one rule for interpreting the Bible? Context. Amen. It's a well-learned church. Amen. Context. This word, even, is completely dependent upon what comes around it. On the water. Not through the water. Not in the water. None of those are good definitions for this word. Good usages. On the water the necessary response to what we come in contact with, what we have to traverse. Lord, if it is you, command me, and I will come to you on the water. No, command me to come to you on the water. He's asking for the command to do something supernatural. 
How are you feeling, church? Are you asking for the command to do something supernatural? Peter is incredible. The fact that he steps out of the boat and doesn't dive into the water is incredible. We've talked about that. I'm focusing on this moment. I said that I was going to do that. The burden of God's people is God's heart for the world. We are his chosen agent. That burden that is on us that says we have to find those who don't know him yet. We have to build a community around one voice that expresses the kingdom, this burden for God's people. God will draw you out of your comfort zone. What lies beyond the comfort zone is not about where he takes you, but who he takes you to. The lost, the orphan, the widow, and the foreigner in your land. Don't forget, you are disciples of Christ. Jesus left his comfort zone to meet us, to build a community, to build a family, calling out disciples from different families so that they would come together and look like no other community ever has before. Jesus left his comfort zone. And for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy set before him. Where is your joy? Is our joy found in being comfortable? Or is our joy set on eternity? For the joy set before us, what will we endure? What will you be asked to endure? What will you be commanded to cross, to walk? Have you glimpsed the joy set before us? These people that we're drawn to will be from all lands, all nations, all ethnicities, all walks of life. We must be trained in bridge building so that we can be sure, hear this, so that we can be sure we are making disciples of Christ and not disciples of our culture. This is a training we have to understand. It starts with me, personally. It starts with me knowing who I am, where I come from, what is the culture that I was raised in. And then it goes corporately. What is our culture as our family? What is our church culture? To know that, to walk through that, to discuss that, to know what's distinct in this family. We are a kingdom family, and we are passionate to advance the gospel. So if we are trained in those two things, here's the cool thing about what Jesus does. He doesn't then just tell his disciples about the other cultures. Do you notice what he does? I got, I, I, I'm going to say it this way. My mom got it. <laughs> he sends us. So that we go in humility as servants of the living God to learn from. To minister to. Just like he did. That training in bridge building has a point to it. Has a goal to it. We have to be trained so that we are not making disciples of our culture. There's this thing that's out there that says, if you behave this way or if you talk this way, then you are blank. If you do blank, then you are blank. Does that sound familiar? Everybody should be nodding because everybody's doing it. If you are blank, then you are blank. Sometimes it's negative, sometimes it's positive. Most of the time it's negative right now. If you are blank, if you say this, if you do this, then you are blank. Well, that's behavior modification. That's making disciples of a culture, right? In Christ, we are all sinners. 
saved by the grace of God. If you are a sinner, then you need Jesus. If you have Jesus, then you're set free to minister. To minister. It's interesting when I say this, because I see everybody nodding, and I have to say this. If you think I'm talking about someone else, if you are thinking in your minds, right on, Josh, I hope that person hears you. Stop it. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to me. I don't have it all figured out. The only one who did is Jesus Christ. I follow him. I introduce people to him. Kingdom is messy. Everybody comes from different places. They don't behave the way I want them to. Way back in my boat, they're all standing up. Every time they get in the boat, they're standing up and they knock everything off. Jesus, if it is you, command me and I will come to you on the water. I want to live a supernatural life. I want to live for eternity. I'm talking to us. I'm calling us out, Christ Church. What is happening is a new thing. It will be different. The question is, will we be? Are we going along for it? Are we hearing it? Are we seeing it? Will we allow ourselves to be reformed so we can be a community of irresistible influence and through us, God's chosen agent, we will transform the world if we allow ourselves to be reformed so that we can be a transforming, transformed community. Are we culture enforcers or freedom fighters? Are we fruit checkers or fishermen? Are we disciple makers or zealots or Pharisees? Pharisees say, if you don't have this behavior, then you're not right. Zealots say, if you don't have this behavior, we're going to make you. We are being called out by Jesus. Worship team, come on up here. Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. They were trained to step out. It starts with me. It moves to us and sends us to serve others. This is even the strategy as we move in these racial reconciliation talks, which you have heard, which we've started. We fasted, we prayed, we're looking for the next three months to gather once a month. For the younger group, I will be leading that with Mackay, and that starts on June 9th, correct? This Thursday, June 9th, from 6.30 to 8.30. And the first concept is that Jesus reconciled everyone to himself. What is the context of talking reconciliation? The next month, we'll be talking about Jesus, the servant, who washes the disciples' feet and then said, you do this. All of our feet are dirty. We wash one another's feet. And then the third month, we will be sent out. These are mission teams in training, these groups. God is calling us to a new thing. I'm seeing it among the churches that we relate to right here in the Twin Cities. We are growing into a family of churches to be able to minister together, to impact the Twin Cities in Minnesota in a way we never have before. Lord, if it's you, command me and I will come to you on the water calling us out to step into the supernatural. Step into the supernatural. We need to be in the Word. We need to be reading the Word of God. Let me ask you something. In a given year, 
Do you read more books about the Bible or more books of the Bible? We need to know the voice of God so that when we ask as a good servant, Lord, if it's you, command me and I will come to you on the water, we recognize the voice. His voice and nobody else's. Not mine. Not your favorite theologian. Not your favorite resource. His voice is supreme. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He's the one who left his comfort zone to not just build a family and bring about the teaching of the kingdom, but to lay down his life See, when we are called out of the boat, what we are called into is a life of sacrifice to be cross-bearers and not just be cross-wearers. To bear that cross, to sacrifice what is comfortable, to sacrifice what is easy for what is next, for what he calls us to. And I I say again, who he calls us to. Who he calls us to. Jesus Christ knew that those who he was going to would kill him. That he was going to lay down his life for the very ones who nailed him to the cross. For the very ones who judged others, he was going to not only love them, heal them, work with them, walk with them, but he was going to be nailed to the cross for them so that anyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And on the cross, he looks out and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He forgives even as he's being slain. He shed his blood so that we would be washed and placed into right relationship. How dare we make that demand of anyone else? Point them to Jesus. Because he also said, it is accomplished. The work of righteousness is accomplished on the cross. His body was broken so that we could become one body, his body, his hands and feet working in this world for the restoration of all things, to bring all nations together into one new humanity so that the world will know that the gospel is true, that we are his disciples by the way we love one another. This is the way he loved us. And he reminded us And we're reminded again throughout the New Testament, whenever you gather together, do this in remembrance of me. Take the blood, take the cup in remembrance of what Jesus did. That is the reason we have been set free. What he has accomplished is why we have been set free. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your sacrifice. Lord Jesus, if it is you, command us and we will come to you on the water. We want to hear your voice, Lord. We need you in the midst of this storm. The winds are against us, Lord. We've been battered by the waves. Lord, if it is you, command us and we will come to you on the water. Lord Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. as we respond now in worship, as we respond now following what you told us to take these elements in remembrance of you, we remember that we do this until you return. Lord, we look forward to that joy that is set before us. So excited to be with you in eternity, Lord, with all my brothers and sisters. worshiping you. So Lord, now receive these praises. 
receive these praises. May you be glorified this morning as we worship you in Jesus Christ. In your mighty name, I pray. Amen and amen.